All right, good day to you. God bless you. Ready to say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to have some specials. As you can see, parable of the fig tree. Jesus told every Christian, all the followers that would follow him, you must, he didn't say maybe you should get around to it, he said learn the parable of the fig tree. It was necessary for you to understand and serve as a Christian. That's how important it is. And that is to say and understand God's word. That's why Christ was so emphatic that you learn that parable. The fig then becomes a very important thing because it's used symbolically to say a great deal more than is even written. And we're going at this time to go into that parable of the fig tree. It will probably take us about two days. And we're going to tackle it. Let's understand the simplicity in which Christ taught. Turn with me with the word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, chapter 7 of the book of Matthew. And let's begin with verse 15. Now, listen to the words of Christ, all right? He says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. In other words, they look like a Christian. One of the... Uh, Christ followers, but inwardly they are raving wolves. In other words, one that claims to be a man of God, that is to say a prophet, and is not familiar with our Heavenly Father's Word, can only in be influenced by the traditions of the world, and the wolf naturally is symbolic of Satan himself. So naturally, when they assume traditions though they would faint if you were to say they were doing the work of Satan when they claimed to be uh, prophets, ministers, teachers, evangelists. But if they are teaching traditions of men rather than the words of Christ, they are dangerous. Because the way you deceive one, one is one that wants to follow Christ and respects a symbol, an individual that stands claiming to be of Christ and doesn't know anything about what Christ teaches or said that you are in good standing with the Father who is the judge of all. Beware of false prophets. 16. How do you know them? Listen to the simplicity in which Jesus taught. 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? In other words, what Christ is telling you, it's really this simple. Do men gather grapes off of a thorn bush, the bramble bush, which is the bramble thorn is symbolic of Satan. Okay, remember the, back in the Old Testament, the trees which wanted to be king and the bramble bush, the thorn bush said, I'll be your king as long as you'll promise you'll stay in my shade or shadow. And a thorn bush doesn't cast a shadow. You see, no protection. But I, I don't want, I, I want to beg that no one think I'm talking down to anyone, but what is Christ talking about here? Well, the subject was open about prophets, ministers, teachers, evangelists, someone that claims to be teaching God's word or speaking of his prophecies. Now, anyone is intelligent enough to know that you're not going to get grapes off of a thorn bush or that you're not going to get figs off of a thistle. Well, how does that apply to people then? If someone that is a one-verse Charlie or never quite gets around to opening God's word, and that's what every Christian is supposed to absorb, then you're eating off of a thistle, friend. A thistle that doesn't amount to a hill of beans. You get grapes from the vine, and Christ is the vine, and this is Christ's word. Now, anyone is intelligent enough to pick up on that in the simplicity in which he teaches. Well, what do you mean? I mean, test their fruit 
do they teach God's word or do they not? End of subject. A one verse Charlie doth not teach God's word. He teaches the traditions of men. God's word is taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse because only God himself through the prophets that he sent can keep the subject and the object in the, in the order in which it consummates the object or subject that Christ or our Father wishes to bring forth to your mind. So you test the fruit of a prophet, teacher, minister, evangelist by whether or not their fruit, that is to say that that comes forth, is God's Word. It's that simple. Got it? Okay. 17. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. In other words, if someone really teaches God's Word, it brings forth good fruit, that is to say, uh, people's minds filled with God's truth, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. In other words, there, a corrupt tree that claims to be a tree of prophecy is going to actually be a bunch of beggars. That's what it's going to end up being. Because God will not support them. Thus, they must become beggars. I, I know I may offend some, but it's time, you know, we're in the final generation, which this parable, the fig tree, that's one of the reasons Christ wanted you to learn it. So you're, you're either participating in church or you're practicing sideshow politics, shenanigans, bad fruit. A good tree, that is to say, if you teach, you see, what trees are we talking about? Go back to the beginning. There was the tree of life which is Christ himself. And there was the tree of good and evil, which is Satan. Oh, he can seem to be so very good. But he is from inside as the wolf, evil. Which tree will you partake of? Are you intelligent enough to understand when you hear God's word, chapter by chapter, or verse by verse, or some prattling uh, wolf in sheep's clothing, or a preacher's robe, that never quite gets around to mentioning the Father, the Son, or especially the Word. Man doesn't have all that much to say to you, my friend. Uh, anyone that has lived any years at all on this earth knows that compared to our Father, man has really very a few important thoughts concerning the eternity. They all come from our Father, for all wisdom flows from Him. Okay, you got that? It's real simple. Let's follow it. 18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Hey, once you spot them, mark them. They're not going to change, most likely. 19, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. God starts judging at the pulpit. And there will be many that will be hewn down. That's what he's talking about. Beware of false prophets, which appear to be sheep, but they're a wolf in sheep's clothing, raving. Be very careful. Playing church is a dangerous thing without the aid of our Father's blessings. That is to say, his word. It's a very serious thing. 20. Wherefore... By their fruits ye shall know them. Know who? False prophets, false preachers, false teachers. You will know them by their fruit, whether they are beggars or men or women of God. It's that simple. Verse 21. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven... In other words, there's your answer. Well, how do I know the will of my Father in heaven? From His Word. Is that difficult? This is the tree that you partake of. This is the same tree, and as much as the living Word is Christ, then it is the tree of life um, that you discover in the 22nd chapter of Revelation that gives life for the eternity. And your good fruit is right here from the Word of God. And what God is saying, 
everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is not going to make it. Because there are many that say, Lord, Lord, and absolutely have no conception of what the Word of God teaches in reality, in the simplicity in which Christ taught. Verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Question. Oh, hey, they spent years of bapity, 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 bapity. Preach, 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 preach. And probably have not taught one chapter from God's word. But they told about old Aunt Hannah and old Uncle Joe and, and Billy Joe from Kokomo and what a great person they were. Do you, know what God, do you know what Christ is going to say to characters like that that claim to be preachers, teachers, and prophets of God's word? And in thy name have we cast out devils. Oh, yes, we've held revivals and we've chased those devils around the room. And in thy name have many wonderful works. We've built such great, wonderful buildings in thy name. 23. And then... Christ speaking, well, I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Get out of my sight. Do you know, are you a fruit inspector? Are you intelligent enough that you can tell whether someone is teaching God's word? To teach God's word, you must read from his word. You must convey the thought that God has in the metaphors, idioms, figures of speech, acrostics, customs of the time, and let the Word do the teaching in the simplicity in which Christ taught to be teaching Christ's Word. Aunt Nellie don't get it done. All right, and that's no uh, disrespect to Aunt Nellie. It's just that no one, nothing can replace the good fruit from the Word of God. Can you begin to see why Christ said you must learn? Learn the parable of the fig tree. This is kind of the basic step. Well, and I know some are going to say, well, when did he say that? Uh, well, first, let's see a little more about the fig before we turn with me to the 11th chapter of this, uh, of... Um, no, let, I'll tell you what. Let's go on to Mark. Let's put it together right. When did Christ say that? Let's get it first. Mark chapter 13. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 28 where he made this statement. Christ has just told of the coming of the false Messiah and how that you must be educated from his word. He stipulates in verse 6 of that same chapter for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. They're going to claim to be a teacher of Christ's word, but they're a bunch of fakes. There's going to be many. He didn't say a few, but a lot that claim to teach God's word, but never quite get around to it. And then he tells of the coming of Antichrist and how God's elect would stand against that spurious Messiah, rather than the trot of being blasted off into the atmosphere with their flyaway doctrine. It is not written. And the ignorance of the Greek is what causes many to fall the fallacy, follow the fallacy. He did not say maybe the false Christ would come before we gathered back to him. He stated in verse 22 of this same chapter, for false Christ and false prophet shall rise. The problem is, are you going to listen to them? Well, how do I know? He just told you. You listen to one that produces the vine or the tree of God's word and teaches you how to deal with it whereby you can understand it. Now, concerning the one subject that we're following now, the fig tree, verse 28. Let's have it on the screen, if we may. Of the 13th chapter of Mark, Christ continuing in that same vein. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. He didn't say maybe. He didn't say perhaps, he said learn it. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, did it say fruit? No. 
When it putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. Well, what summer? It's harvest time, end of the world. The question at the beginning of this chapter is when is the end of the world coming? When is Christ returning? And he gives the seven events that are the seven trumpets that consummate the end of this age. Are you familiar with them? I pray you are. We just covered the book of Revelations. You should be. You see, you learn a great deal when you listen to the teachings of God and get the real fruit right from the source, the living tree, rather than a bunch of traditions. Betty by stories, sweet by and by, all you have to do is, all you have to do is get the fruit from the right tree. There's only one that's the word of God, regardless of who is the reader or whatever. The only fruit comes from the true tree of life, which is to say Christ, the living word, this word. Verse 29. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, that's the seven events that consummate this, the end of this age, and they are rapidly, know that it is nigh even at the doors. In other words, you're right at the door of the end of the age. That's how you tell. What do you mean how you tell? The parable of the fig tree. That's why we're teaching it. Okay? 30. Verily I truly, seriously, I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things, things be done. You see how important it is? Because when you know the parable of the fig tree, you know that when it is established, that that generation will be the final generation. No man knows as if you were to follow the three uh, units are, are put into one article, which is to say a year, month, date, and so forth, which means instant. Nobody knows the instant. But God's elect should know the season, which is to say generation. All you have to do is understand the parable of the fig tree then, and you know that generation. It is not a man figuring dates, but a sign from Almighty God and a promise that is true and shall come to pass exactly as it's written during the generation in which the final seven steps, which are the seven seals, the seven plagues, and the seven trumps. In other words, each of the things uh, spoken of and brought out and documented in this 13th chapter consummate the end of this age and the parable of the fig tree basically sets the parameters of the generation. You will know when we finish this lecture on the parable of the fig tree. It is necessary that you understand it. When you understand the parable of the fig tree, you understand why Eve and Adam put fig leaves over their private parts when they had sinned. It's part of the parable in knowing who the false ones come to, the false prophets, those that Christ will say, get out of my sight. I never knew you. And there would be some that would say, well, that's not what the scripture said. He said, depart from me. <laughs> Have you ever heard him say depart when he was angry? Was Christ ever angry? Yes, he was. Righteous indignation. We're going to turn to one of the times that he was continuing step by step building in your mind how to test the fruit of whether a minister is a real minister, teacher, or whatever you follow, or a student yourself of what you are to read and what you are to take fruit off of to be better informed of God's Word. I quite frankly, aside from, from books written by men uh, relating historical events, or documentation of travels or so forth of peoples, as far as someone writing a book that improves upon God's word, do you know what I want to tell you? I think it's a waste of time. Don't pick man's book. Some character was going to correct me on the on 
the rapture theory so-called and he, he was so stupid that he dared use a man's writing of the end of the world. Now that is about to tell this scholar, a student of the text, to do that is an insult. The person that wrote the book he was speaking of didn't have enough sense to pour water out of a boot, much less comment on God's word and poor innocent fools are sucked in because they cannot understand the simplicity of honey go to the right tree to pick your fruit and you'll be all right which is the word of God no they got to filter around in the dark and grab a hold of every false doctrine in the world in the world and expect to stumble over the truth as though it were a needle in a haystack when it was there all the time that's what Christ is telling you learn the parable of the fig tree. All right, I can really get wrapped up on this subject because people are being deceived in this generation and a child should be able to see it when they understand the teachings of God's truth. Chapter 11, verse 11 in the same book of Mark. <clears throat> Learn the parable of the fig tree. Listen and grow in your father's word. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. Do you know what the temple is? God's house. And when he had looked around about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, and he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. In another scripture it says he looked angrily. He sighed, which means he snorted when he saw what was going on. They were selling mite infested doves and money changing right in God's house uh, when God's word is supposed to be taught there. And offerings of the best of your flock rather than rushing down and stopping at the quick trip on the, uh, quick trip on the temple steps and buying some fuzzy, sickly dove and trying to offer it to God as a peace offering. He wasn't happy. Verse 12. And on the morrow, the next day, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Verse 13. And seeing a fig tree, wake up for me, and seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came. If haply it he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Do you think for one moment that Christ did not know the season of figs? That is to say, when they ripen and when they don't ripen? Of course he did. He knew there were no figs and there were only leaves on this tree. And the reason he utilized it is for the simple reason, know when the leaves shoot forth. 14. And Jesus answered, said unto it, and this is Christ speaking to a tree. Sounds strange? Well, listen, it says a great deal more than is written. Can you learn the parable behind it? I hope so. I pray so. No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever, period. And his disciples heard it. Do not cut yourself off from fig jam, which is probably one of the best jams in the world, because he's speaking to the bad fig. I hope if you learned one lesson about a few fruit inspector that there are good trees and there are bad trees. And I'll teach you a little bit about the horticulture of a fig tree in a few moments, and it will clarify for you. Listen on. 15. And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple. He took a cat of nine tails, and he laid it to their backs. He hit those money tables, and you could hear the coins as they rang, as they spilled, and he laid the whip to them and drove them out of the church of God and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, might infested poor substitutes of your love for your father. And would not suffer that any man 
should carry any vessel through the temple. He stopped that commerce. 17. And he taught, say, you knew when he taught? This is how, now you're getting fruit right from the vine. What did he teach? And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Unfortunately, that holds so true today that people get involved for their own gain and God only knows what all else, what reason, egos and so forth and never seem to get around to teaching the emotions of our Father and His outreaching love to the heart and mind of each soul that will love Him. The guidance that He gives us that keeps us from trouble, keeps us from the rocky shore and keeps us safe even in the flesh body, 18. And the scribes and the chief uh, priest heard it. These are your religious people, you got it? Preachers of the day. And sought how they might destroy him, sweet folks. For they feared him because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. They tested the fruit and they kind of liked his fruit, 19. And when even was come, he went out of the city. What did he do? Verse 20, and in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree, I repeat, fig tree, dried up from the roots. Boy, that's pretty fast service overnight. It documents and emphasizes the importance of the parable. 21, and Peter called to remembrance and said unto him, Master, that's to say teacher, behold, the fig tree which thou cursedest is withered away. And Jesus answering said unto him, Have faith in God. Now this is not to say have faith in some man. Have faith in God and his word. You know what faith is? 23, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, that means this nation, be thou removed, and he's talking about the Kenite nation, the nation of the bad fig, be thou removed and be thou cast into the city, sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Pretty strong statement, but it's strong in this sense. He's talking about the bad fig and its nation. And any individual that knows the truth, the real fruit from the proper tree, understands what he's saying. I want to get into the heart of culture just a little bit. We'll pick this up in the next lecture then so that you totally understand the parable, but you must understand this horticulture. Well, why would he use the fig tree? Because of its horticulture. You would see the entire picture if you looked. Anytime God uses something as a symbol, the entire life of that insect, animal, plant, or whatever gives you the most in-depth thought of his mind that he's relating to you. What about the fig tree? I'm going to use two uh, types. I'm going to use Smyrna, like the church of Smyrna. Smyrna fig is a very good fig. It's the female fig. And then there's the caprice, which is the male fig. unedible, terrible. You can't not eat them. They are so bad. Well, why would God create something like that? Well, listen. Listen. Number one, you do not plant a fig tree by a seed. You set out a shoot. And that is symbolic of the nation that would be planted 
of both the good and the bad fig that would consummate the end of the age, the generation, that is to say, the beginning of the final generation. So it's very important. Now, many people feel that the fig is a non-blossoming plant, and that's false. You see, in the end of each fig, there's a tiny hole. And then inside the fig plant itself is the many, many blossoms inside the fig. Again, the Smyrna, or the good fig, is the female. The Capri is the male, or the goat fig, is what some keepers call it. And it likewise has the little hole with the flowers inside. It's the male. Now there is a little fig wasp. Yes, I said wasp. And you must gain every ounce of information fitting your generation because it was written, the parable of the fig tree was written to the final generation when the terminology wasp would mean more than a little flying bug. The wasp, though, which is known as the little fig wasp, goes into the little hole at the end of the fig on the caprice tree that man cannot eat and takes the pollen from the flowering plant from within and then goes to the Smyrna, the female tree, and pollinates the fig whereby the fig can have a continued life. In other words, the wasp, you can be thankful to it that both the good and the bad fig tree exist as God created them. And that, my dear friend, is very true today, that the dumb wasp, as some call them, and I certainly call some of them dumb, which offends a great many people, but be that as it may, I could care less. They support and make possible both trees also because of their ignorance of testing fruit which is to say, understanding the living word of God that they do not know one tree from the other. And I speak spiritually now, not the difference between the Smyrna and the Caprice. They don't know whether they're hearing the truth or not because they don't understand how to, the simplicity in which Christ taught. What tree is it coming from? If it's coming from the word of God, then you're, you're practicing good fruit if the common sense in which Christ teaches flows with the subject and the teacher that is teaching teaches you how to understand it for yourself. That's the only way you will ever find the good mark of a teacher is that he teaches you how to check him or her out to document what they say, whether it is true or not, not from traditions of men or some stupid book about end times written by some nut claiming to be a Christian, and many people say, well, that's old Barney. Everybody knows Barney. Barney's, I love you, you love me, we've got a family. Now, now, God bless the lady that brought forth the character that teaches love to children. Unfortunately, there's nothing but a bunch of children playing church that the Barney song would fit quite well to sum up their entire works as far as fruit being produced. So, it is no accident that the church of Smyrna, the good fig, teaches who the Kenites are. For the Kenites, as you will find in the next lecture, are the bad goat fig that brings forth, even into this day, and helps you better understand what would happen in the final generation whereby you could tell that that consummates the end of this age. It's very simple. So simple the way Christ teaches. All you have to do is understand the horticulture of the fig and observe the seven signs given before that and then you really enlarge your understanding, your knowledge, concerning the final generation. I hope you don't miss the last part of this lecture. 
because we're going to nail it, document it, the parable of the fig tree and the generation to which it applies, applies by the actual setting forth of the shoot and where it was to be planted as it is written in God's word. Don't ever, ever, ever let some religion tell you that it was planted in Rome so bad, so such vile fruit to say it's planted in Rome when God's word tells you exactly where it's planted. Or San Francisco, this mountain of seven hills. Oh, we're so intelligent. Yes, seven, seven hills. Men, folly, ignorance, bliss, on it goes. I hope if you've learned any one thing from this lecture, though I may have angered some, I could care less. This is the good tree. If this is being taught, as Jesus would say, it is written. It certainly is. And do you know something, beloved? That's exactly how it's going to come to pass. So you have a choice. You can partake of this tree, the truth, and be informed, or you can listen to fuzzy heads, brains, and always wonder. It's up to you. Uh, and I'm saying, no man within himself knows. God's word is the tree. That's my point, all right? Surely you can tell when you're being taught God's word or man's word, all right? How many verses, the last time you attended church, last time you attended Bible study, how many Verses did you read from the Word of God? And I'm not talking about some quarterly that is a simulation written by God only knows who, maybe a servant of Satan disguised to translate quarterlies and so forth for a congregation that is biblically illiterate and would never know that. How many scriptures did you read from the Word of God with, with understanding? Now, I didn't say how many did you read, period. I said with understanding. Standing, You read with understanding because there is a teacher there either who will explain it or gone through the Spirit gives you the knowledge to be able to pick up on it that you have the tools necessary to take it back to the Greek, Hebrew, Chaldee, whatever the case may be, that you can see and understand the dual meanings in, of many scriptures even and feel that friendship and closeness to our Father by communicating with Him in his word. What am I saying? Were you taught out of God's Bible? Or were you taught from some book published and printed by man? Hey friend, if you're not smart enough to know, you can get in trouble with this other junk. Coming from God's word, you're never in trouble. Jesus said, that is the tree and that only. Do you know what he's going to say to many of these others? And some of them are good. I'm not knocking or anything. I'm just saying anytime you get away from the Word of God, you better have your safety belt on, friend. Because you may be in the group that he says, get out of my sight. I never knew you. You read that trash written by, do you know who? I would say the same thing to those that t read quarterlies. Do you know the individual that translated it from the Hebrew and Greek? I will even go as far to say, were they Christian? Because a Christian that will let a non-Christian do his translating for him is a fool. That's simple. I'll document that. Many years ago, the, the story was started that Christ was married to Mary Magdalena. And this is not an insult, but what he did, he stated a non-Christian translating the manuscript saw where Mary Magdalena was espoused to Christ. Well, now a Christian knows what that means. It was speaking spiritually. So they don't know, come here from Sikkim about translating Christian literature. So take it from the tree. I don't want to digress, but I want to nail the point. A child knows when they're studying God's word or something else. Which do you want to answer to? Somebody else or God? I'll tell you who you're going to answer to, God. 
Think about it. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please? All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Parable of the fig tree. Christ didn't say, maybe you should learn the parable of the fig tree. He said, learn it. And quite frankly, there is no way that you're going to know the season of the final generation without the information, the parable of the fig tree. Now let's go back, if we may, to the first lecture on this subject. Let's uh, recap it just a little bit so that you're familiar. Naturally, in, Ma in Mark chapter 13 is where you are told, learn it. That was his sermon, giving you the seven events that consummate the end of this age, which is to say they're the same as the seven trumpets, the seven seals, and the seven vials, put forth in the simplicity in which Christ only could teach. But he said, learn the parable of the fig tree. Well, then um, taking that into consideration, we went to the incident where he cursed this particular type fig tree. And always remember, when God utilizes a plant, an insect, or an animal, it symbolizes a great deal more than is written. What is it about a fig tree? The fig tree is not planted by seed. It's set out as a shoot planted as a shoot. And then it comes forth, the uh, naturally leaves first. And that's what you were to be on guard for because the fig he wanted you to observe does not produce fruit that is edible. In other words, the bad fig. But there's also good figs. We're going to be covering that in this particular lecture. Now, with that thought in mind, why would he say that? And why is the fig tree used to symbolize so much in our Father's word through the teachings of Christ, such as that he would go to one? He knew it was out of season. He knew there would be no fruit on the tree. And yet he cursed the tree. Therefore, we know that there are two type fig trees. Real quickly, Smyrna, the name of the church mentioned in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, that he was pleased with. The Smyrna fig is the female fig. The Caprice is the male or goat fig, which is unedible. You can't eat them. They're unfit to eat. However, there is a little hole in the end of each fig. The, um, the uh, lower part of it and within the fig are the flowers of the tree. In other words, it is a flowering plant. It's just that they are inside the fig itself. And there is a little wasp, fig wasp, that pollinates back and forth between the male and the female fig. With that having been said, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 24, which is the heart, if you would, of the parable of the fig tree. With that thought in mind, we ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Let's get cracking. All right, 24 verse 1. The Lord showed me, and behold, Two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. Now, the temple of the Lord has one geographical location, and that's Mount Zion. So understand where you are, ge geographically speaking, so that you understand the prophecy. After, important now, after that Nebuchadnezzar, or Reza as it is here, king of Babylon had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah with the carpenters and smiths from Jerusalem. Where are they from? From Jerusalem. That's the geographical spot we're focusing on. And had brought them to Babylon. Now, I want, I want to emphasize, if you're not uh, familiar with biblical history, the house of Israel had been taken captive 200 years prior to this incident. So we're focusing on Judah. Judah is part of the sign of the fig. All right? In other words, the parable of the fig tree. And the location, of course, being Jerusalem. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, his captivity lasted 70 years. But when you read the book of Ezra, and this is important, Many that cannot understand the Hebrew, only about half those that returned were children of Judah. The others were Nethanim. Nethanim is a Hebrew word that means 
Nathan is to service or given to service. In other words, the preachers got too lazy to cut their own wood. So they dedicated certain peoples to do part of the temple work. And within this, as a matter of fact, in the book of Ezra, Ezra went on their way back to Jerusalem at the end of the captivity. Ezra helped um, a little head count and not one Levitical priest did he have with him. They were all Nethanim. I mean, that's how far those that had taken over the priesthood. And that's why you want to be very careful even to this day. You want to be very careful as we begin Christ telling you how to determine. He said you test a false prophet by his fruit. You don't get figs off of a vine tree. You know, most people, and you don't learn God's word from a preacher that's a one verse Charlie and never teaches the word of God either, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. That, you know, it doesn't take a real bright person to figure that out or to understand it. All right? So, here we have then the Nethanim returning back to this place and thus you have the kind of the secret of separating the goat figs from the true figs. With that having been said, let's go with verse 2. One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe. Boy, I mean, that's the plush of the crop, all right? And the other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Of course, these being goat or caprice, the male fig. You don't eat them. They're not edible, all right? Verse 3. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. The good figs, very good. And the evil, very evil, that, can't not, that cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Now, beloved, I want you to let your mind, if you would, go back to the beginning. I want you to let your mind go to the garden where we had the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Which did Eve partake of? Naturally, it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is quite simply to say Satan. And with that, we see the bad fig. We'll be talking more about that in a moment. But what are we talking about? We're talking about Jerusalem. We're talking about Judah. And the subject then being set in the heart of the parable. Let's go with it. Verse 4. Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, 5. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans, that's to say Babylon, for their good, for their own good. Now, again, to return in the first uh, migration back to Jerusalem, which did not last long. They were driven out in 70 A.D. by a little ten-horned general, uh, Titus, Roman general, that is. But very few of Judah returned at that particular time. God said, I'm going to treat certain as very good figs. Six, for I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them, and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. What has happened in your lifetime? In the year, for someone my age, in the year 1948, Judah returned to Jerusalem. Judah set up a kingdom. And unfortunately, we see within that a kingdom, a country, a nation. We see both good and bad figs. And that's what God wants you to be aware of. Naturally, what's he talking about? The Kenites. That's why he would say to the church of Smyrna, named for that fig. In Revelation 2.9, you are blessed for your knowledge to know those that claim to be of our brother Judah but in fact are of the synagogue of Satan. So you have both baskets on the return. The information is that in learning the parable of the fig tree, 
you understand where the spurious Messiah shall appear and who he shall appear to. All right? Very important. But God's promise that after it was established, well, has it been established uh, several times? No. Once. Since the year 70 A.D. And that was in the year of our Lord, 1948. Now, we'll have you remember Christ's prophecy concerning that, concerning the parable of the fig tree. Listen and learn more now from the fig. Seven. And I will give them an heart to know me, to know the truth, to know God's word, not man's word, that I am the Lord and, that, and they shall be my people, as it would be in the book of Hosea, not lo ami, but ami, my people. And I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. He's talking here about the good figs, all right? What about the bad? Verse 8. And as the evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so evil, surely thus saith the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and his princes, and the residue. What does residue mean? It doesn't mean Judah, necessarily. It means anyone that claims to be of Judah, or as we say today, a resident. Many of you are residents of your specific state or nation as we go around the world at this time. That makes you a residue of that particular location. So naturally, again, we speak of um, the residue that claim to be of Judah and in fact do lie and are of the synagogue of Satan. And this certainly gives our brother Judah a great deal of trouble. I must remind you again in the Greek what the word Jews, as it is used in Revelation 2.9, means. The word is eudas, and it means, and this is very important, it means of the tribe of Judah or a resident of the land of Judea, which is the nation of Judah. So it's like when you live in Arkansas, you're either an Arkansas-er, as some of us say, or you're an Arkansan. But that has nothing to do with your tribe, your heritage, or anything else. That's, a, that's an identifier by geographical location. This has caused our brother Judah a great deal of difficulty, and it's important that you remain open-minded whereby you recognize that. Now, and the residue of where? Of Jerusalem. Not Rome, not some other city, of Jerusalem that remaineth in his, this land, and them that dwell in the land of Egypt. Verse 9. And I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt. And so the Kenites were, along with a certain other elements scattered to the world, and yes, to their own hurt, to be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse in all places whither I shall drive them. And so it is, not only to Judah, but to the house of Israel, which is the other ten tribes. We were promised by God in the book of Amos, in chapter 6, verse 14, that we'd, we would be cursed at, from the time that the nation Hamath, from the entering in of Hamath, who was the father, one of the fathers at that time of the writing, of the Kenites, which simply means sons of Cain, and um, that we would be cursed from that time forward. Uh, and certainly, they are bad figs. Have been, always will be, and continue to be. It is the equivalent of the tares of Matthew chapter 13. Verse 10. And I will send the sword of famine and the pestilence among them, till they be consumed from off of the land, from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. In other words, in 70 AD, all were dispersed from Jerusalem. And they wandered the world, living in this country, that country. But in the year of our Lord, 1948, they returned and set out to shoot 
And it has grown now for many years. It puts forth leaves. It would not bring forth fruit. Uh, that is to say, that was not the thing you were to watch for, but the leaves. Leaves for what? Leaves for healing, for one thing. But there you have the parable of the fig tree, and you can understand why Christ would say, when you see the fig, the shoot, begin to put forth leaves, know that this generation shall not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. That is a blank statement from our Heavenly Father, and you can understand why it is very important that Christ would say, not maybe you should learn the parable of the fig tree. He said, learn it. Because it allows you not to know the year, the day, but to know the generation. That generation began in 1948. Both good and bad figs set in that place and time marches on. Now, there's still a great deal more to learn concerning the parable. Uh, let's, 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 if we may, let's go on back to Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. Let's go to chapter 34. Let's learn a little more of what Father would say. Never take one witness, always look for another. Isaiah chapter 34, verse 1, and it reads, Come near, ye nations, to hear. In other words, this is important. God is saying, and nations in the plural means all races. This is important to you. And hearken, ye people, let the earth hear. That's this globe on which we reside. And all that is therein. All means exactly that the world and all things that come forth of it. In other words, this address, many people will ask me, well, when is my particular race addressed in God's word? Well, this is all. This means all of the races are addressed in this specific verse. All right? God says, this message is for you. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. He's not happy. And his fury upon all their armies, he hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. The slaughter, this is a divine ban. It is placed, all the nations are placed under it. And don't forget what the enemy is of the end times. It's deception. It's for nations to be deceived. And quite frankly, if you look at the nations in the world today where we sit, and I'll be dating this, but be that as it may, the United Nations is supposed to be that part that comes to agreement. Do you know that we have 400 United Nation troops that are supposed to be peacekeepers that are captives at this time? And in our nation that is blessed, the superpower of superpowers of the free world, we have young children gunning each other down as though they were dueling in the streets as times of old. We have lost the ability to respect each other with dignity in as much as we are taught by the so-called educational system that we are all one and you must always think of one rather than respecting each other's religions and our beliefs and respecting them with dignity, whereby you dignify and respect that people. People strike out and they know not why. How interesting. God's word is so precious. Three. Their slain also shall be cast out and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses and the mountain shall be melted with their blood. We're looking forward here to the final hour of this age. That is to say, the age of the flesh. What happens in the final hour? You've, you've heard it taught by Paul, by our Father himself, that in an instant, the flesh is put off in the spiritual body in the twinkle of an eye. What happens to all those bodies? Think about it for a moment. Four. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved. And the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their host, host means people, all right? 
shall fall down as the leaf fa falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. Do you know what happens to an old fig when it's overripe and it falls from the fig tree? Big old nice plump thing. It splatters. Okay. It's not a good falling. Why would it mention, have we got bad people in heaven? Heaven's going to be rolled up like a scroll? Is it not written in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, that this earth age shall be destroyed by fire? Only it is the what specifically that will be destroyed? The elements, which is a Greek word meaning rudiments, which means only the evil, not the good. God isn't angry at those that care. None of us are perfect, but if you care, if you try to serve him, he has no argument with you as far as destroying you or anything about you. But the evil fig, as the fading fig, shall be destroyed. Now many would say, well, what does he mean heaven is rolled up? We move into the third heaven age, from the second to the third, when that particular time comes. And never forget, as Christ would teach you in Luke chapter 16 concerning the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. When you see paradise and, and you see Lazarus, which is a Greek word that is the equivalent of the Hebrew word Eleazar, which is the chief priest of Aaron's son, meaning preacher, teacher, was in the bosom of Abraham. In other words, he was brought back to good standing through Christ's teachings. But the rich man was across the gulf that man could not cross. In other words, where do the dead people go? Well, to be absent from this body is present with the Lord. They are in paradise, but not in good standing. So naturally, there must be a, a millennium. Thus it shall be. And that's why he will say here in a moment that his sword will be bathed in heaven as well. Takes a little housekeeping on all quarters. Okay, verse 5. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. What is his sword? Revelation 1.16. My sword is, my tongue is a two-edged sword. It's his word. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. Now, that geographical location, as it is written in Ezekiel 38 and 39, two chapters before the millennium begins, of course, you know, is the north country, the country of Esau. Verse 6, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness. In other words, it's going to have plenty to do. And with the blood of lambs and goats and with the fat of the kidneys of rams, for the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra. Basra was a fortress of Edom. Understand, this is a prelude to Ezekiel 38 and 39. For a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. You know, we purchased Alaska from Idumea. That is to say, the land of Rush, which you will find written in God's word and in the 38th chapter of Ezekiel, the second in English, it is to you the chief prince. Chief prince in the Hebrew tongue is the chief prince of Rush. Still the same to this day. Don't worry. We have a Cold War ended. Huh. God's word shall come to pass exactly as it's written. Verse 7. And the unicorn, there's no such thing as a unicorn. This word in the text in the Hebrew is wild ox. Okay. The wild ox shall come down with them and the bullocks with the bulls and their land shall be soaked. That's drunken with blood and their dust made fat with fatness. These were animals of sacrifice. And what God is telling you, I'm going to have my part. All right. And he's speaking in, in the, the earth will be fertilized with their blood. Well, maybe, who knows, in a sense, we may find out there what happens in that dimension to the flesh. Verse 8, the reason we came here, concerning the fading fig, the falling fig, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance. Do you know when that happens? It's when he returns. 
and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Where? Geographically? Zion. There's only one place in God's Word referred to as Zion, and that is Mount Zion. And on the north side of Mount Zion is God's favorite place. He made an everlasting covenant with it in Ezekiel chapter 16. He said, this is my favorite spot. And naturally, that's where his temple is. So on the day of recompense, those that understand our Father's word, that he loves his children, all of them, I don't care what race or color you are, that he loves you, and inasmuch as you try, even though you fall short at times, repent and get back in good standing. He's not angry with you. And inasmuch as our Father is a consuming fire, as it is written in the last verse of Hebrews chapter 12, His fire does not affect you. His fire burns that that is evil. His fire to you is the Shekinah glory or the Holy Spirit that warms your heart. All evil shall be destroyed with that sword of the Lord, which is to say His word. His word today alleviates anxieties, troubles, Heartaches solves those problems his love does because it causes you as you absorb his wisdom to know how to handle your life whereby you can take care of problems with his help. But on that day of vengeance and the subject of this particular lecture, when will it happen? Well, it will happen in the time of the fig tree. Now, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's run, if we may, real quickly to chapter 6 in the book of Revelation. Remember, we just finished teaching this book chapter by chapter, but I want you to go back to one verse so that you understand the parable of the fig tree as we are in chapter 6 of uh, the book of Revelation here. And we're going to pick it up there with verse 13. And the sixth um, seal has been opened so that you can see what's happening there. What is happening? The sixth seal and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. This is when Satan and his little fake angels are cast out and Satan himself, Lucifer, which in the Hebrew tongue means the bright morning star, in other words, he's pretending to be Christ, comes to the earth even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs. Not timely figs. Untimely figs means harvested out of season, not waiting for the true season, which is to say the return of the true Messiah, but are sucked in by the any moment doctrine and worship the fake. Don't know the difference. Biblically illiterate. So, again, the sixth seal. Does the New Testament differ with the old? Of course not. There's no different in this verse than the one in Isaiah chapter 34. Listen to it. Her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Hurak in the Hebrew tongue, the spirit of God. 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll. Sound familiar? It should. When it is rolled together and every mountain, that's nation and island, were moved out of their places with the shaking of God. Yes, the changing, the power structure of the nations because there's going to be only one king. 15, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Do you know why? I'll tell you why. Because the simple reason being they've worshipped the spurious Messiah. How would you feel as a Christian? And you've gone in for the big game. And you're playing your heart out here. I mean, he's come. He's trying to get everyone gathered up here, holding the biggest revival the world has ever seen. And you've been told, I've been, we're going to gather together and fly out of here. We're, we're out of here, man. And you're working for him. And all of a sudden, you see the true Christ returning. You're going to be too ashamed to face him. That's why they pray for the rocks to fall on them. 17. As, as we continue, 16 rather, as we continue, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. They know the day of vengeance has come and that they've been had. 
17, for the great day of his wrath or vengeance is come. And who shall be able to stand? You're beginning to see a little bit why he would say, not maybe, learn the parable of the fig tree. Because the fig is even connected with and the replanting of it, an event that has happened only one time. A few short years after Christ walked this earth, became that nation again in the year 1948. How long is a generation? Well, as a student of God's word, there are three generations mentioned. One is the 40-year generation that the children wandered in the wilderness and uh, before they were entered the promised land. Well, it would seem that that would be the one, but that, that passed by in the year 1988. And then there is another generation. What is it in the book of Psalms? That is, let's see, three score, 60 plus 10, 70, 70-year 70 generation. And then there's another generation it's back in Genesis chapter 6, where the Nephilim uh, from the prime Hebrew Napha fallen angels saw the daughters of Adam. They were beautiful. And they took them, and children were born to them, these misfits. And they were Geba, giants. Uh, so God, it grieved God that he had placed man in flesh. That means that he had taken the souls that he had created in the beginning and caused them to be born innocent of woman into a flesh body. Born innocent to make their own mind up whether they're going to love him or love the other. Satan, that is to say. So that's, that's a 120 year generation. I can tell you exactly how long it's going to be. It's going to be from the time of 1948 until Christ returns. The signs of every promise that we would go into one worldism, you don't know it, but you took one of the greatest steps towards one worldism yesterday, and it's called GATT. A lot of our solventry, though, can we live with it? Of course we can. We, can we'll, we will compete with anybody and win. Why? We're a blessed nation of God leader in the free world. Are we not mentioned in God's word? Wouldn't God be a little small had he created a nation that is, is the leader of the free world without it having been mentioned? Anywhere the ten tribes go, thus the blessings of God as he promised. Now, what about the fig tree? Where did it start though? You are told in Revelation chapter 13 verse 18 that you are to count the number of the beast that means what he's saying he says here's wisdom I'm going to tell you how to spot him we'll just bring this right down where the rubber meets the road the word count as it is utilized there in the Greek means to enumerate by pebbles worn smooth over a long period of time like you would carry them in your pocket you know to cast lots with or something like that over a long mean watch them from the very beginning I want real quickly to go with you to Genesis chapter 3, where the trouble started in the beginning. Now, unfortunately, due to the fact that the majority of people in this generation are biblically illiterate, they've been taught by certain one-verse Charlies, oh yes, Eve was strolling out in the park one day, and here come a snake. It doesn't matter that in the book of Revelations you are told that that old serpent Lucifer, the dragon, or the devil, and Satan. Now, it was a snake, and they climbed up an apple tree, and Eve partook of the apple. Now, that's a lie. It's not biblical. It's not in God's Word. And when you lie to children in the Sunday schools of God's own house, you're deceiving them as far as understanding the clarity of God's Word, and quite frankly, Christ himself would teach on the flip side of this coin of the parable of the fig tree, the parable of the tares, he said, you'll either understand this parable or you won't understand any of them. And what was that parable of the tares? That Satan came in the night and planted tares in the garden of God and the children of the good seed were of God and the children of the bad seed were of Satan. All right, be that as it may. 
Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Listen to the woman. What kind of a garden were they in? What kind of a grove were they in, truthfully, from God's Word? And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eye, remember what Christ told you about checking the fruit, be a fruit inspector, all right? You should know by the fruit. If you get an orange off of an apple tree, something's wrong. Got it? That it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Now, listen to that carefully. She took of the fruit and by their fruit you shall know them. The God's commandment was in verse 3 that you shall not touch it. Do you know what that word touch is in the Hebrew tongue? It's naga. Do you know what it means? It means to lie with a woman in, in one case. So don't be deceived. As Eve would say, I was beguiled by the serpent. Paul would teach in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm jealous because I have espoused you to one husband and I don't want you to be beguiled as Eve was by the Satan. The word beguiled in the Greek is expatio and it has one meaning only, to be wholly seduced. And then he continues, because I want to present you as a virgin. Do you know how you lose your virginity? Wake up. Teach your children the truth at a level they can understand. Okay? She took of the fruit herself and then shared with her husband the same fruit. Not her fruit, but the fruit she partook of. Verse 7. And the eyes of them both were opened. Do you know that this is the prime of the word atosh, which is uh, tree? The word tree is etz in the Hebrew, but it comes from the prime atosh, which means the backbone. These are our limbs. The backbone is the, the skeletal formation through which the central nervous system runs that gives you knowledge when it ties into the brain. You're supposed to think with it. The, surely your eyes will be open, or the opening or closing of the eyes is a part of the word atash. And they knew that they were naked. How did they know that? And they sewed fig, F-I-G, fig. What kind of orchard were they in? Apple? No. Fig, yes. Fig leaves together and made themselves mask from where they had eaten the apple. That's not what God's Word says. Don't lie to children in churches. Gave them aprons. They covered their private parts. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from his presence. From the presence, rather, of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam... And um, unto Adam, and he said unto him, Where art thou? Where are you at? He knew, ten. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Eleven. And he said, God, who told thee thou was naked? I mean, they were innocent. How do you know that you are naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman, man's been doing it ever since. Woman's fault. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And that's exactly the way it was. Satan can appear to be whatever he wishes to. 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. You want to know what the, the results of it was? And I will put enmity between God talking to the serpent, then in verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed, sperma, and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so... It was through the woman that Christ would be born. 
and his heels were nailed to the cross. But on the day of vengeance, Satan's head gets it. All right? So, there you have it. Now, why, in as much as we've gone through all this, why is it that the parable of the fig tree was important? I'm going to read it in closing one time for you. Mark 13, where Christ has mentioned the seven events that will transpire just before the day of the Lord. Any child can understand them if you understand the parable of the fig tree. But this is why he told you, why it's so important at this time. Mark 13, verse 28. Now learn, not maybe, learn a parable of the fig tree. When her, le when her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is near. You know what summer is? That's harvest. 29. So ye in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the door. Verily I say unto you, that this generation, what generation? The generation when Judah would be returned as the good fig, and the Kenite is the bad, bad fig back to Jerusalem. 1948. This generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Why is the parable important? It lets you know the final generation without any man's date setting or anything else but pure word from God and when you live in a generation that you can see it. You can see the prophecies unfolding daily around us. How precious the word is that God, if we take a moment to look into the in-depth truth in the simplicity in which he taught, we can learn a great deal about the generation we live in, the generation in which the parable of the fig tree is unfolding and revealing itself. God's not angry at you if you're trying. And I don't care if you're in the gutter, I don't care if you're struck, uh, strung out on drugs, he loves you. Doesn't like what you're doing if that's what you're doing. But he will help you. He's calling out a people that can see the simplicity in which he teaches to be a champion in this end generation. I don't know. Do you have eyes to see and ears to hear? Think about it. The parable of the fig tree. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? <laughs> 